are discussing transplant and uh, without much further ado, I'll take you in the next maybe 16, 17 minutes through a study that we did at both Kenyatta and Aga Khan. Uh, those are my names. We, we entitled it kidney allograft function and its determinants at 12 months post transplant in Kenya. Those are my supervisors, Professor Joshua Kaima, Professor McLeagel, Dr. Ngigi, and Dr. Sokwala, of whom I'm very, very, very proud of. Right, mm, so I'll just dive straight into the, um, the introduction is a bit long, so I would just want to dive into the allograft dysfunction at one year. Um, allograft function at one year is increasingly being used as a surrogate marker for late graft function. We now know that if someone has poor graft function at one year, this particular person has a poorer half-life of the graft at five years, at 10 years, 15 and 20. So it meant that the fact that you can use this for prognostication, oh, thank you. So it has a prognostic value and it corresponds with the lower GFR, like I talked about. Not only does it correspond to the lower GFR, but also it raises the prob probability of eventual allograft loss and cardiovascular uh, death. So in this particular study that we, uh, we cited, recipients who had a serum creatinine of more than 1.5 milligrams or equivalent of 132.6 milli uh, micromoles exhibited a poor graft uh, loss uh, a half life. And that is what we used as a definition of allograft dysfunction in this particular study. So we know some of the factors that affect allograft function. And we looked, at, we looked at these within the study. Some of these factors can be donor factors, others can be recipient, and of course others can be surgical related factors and also institutional institution factors. So the donor factors could include a pre-nephrectomy GFR, you already see us doing um, TTPA for patients, for the, for the donors uh, to, see, to see how much function they have and also to look at which kidney is performing better than the other one. Recipient factors like obesity, diabetes. When someone is, when a, when a recipient is obese, if they, have the, or if they have diabetes, they have a shorter um, graft um, uh, like half-life. Other things like um, HLA matching, which you saw earlier on. Ischemic times are very important, especially within the cadaveric um, programs. And of course, delayed growth function. If a patient gets, gets delayed growth function, uh, this means if they need dialysis within the first week, if they get AKI and need dialysis within the first week of transplant, then they have a poorer um, uh, half-life. So the problem with allograft dysfunction is it is associated with significant morbidity and with an increased one year uh, all cause mortality. Even when you tell a patient where oh, your creatinine is, is rising, the look you see on their faces alone can even put a dark cloud around your own heart. You know, it causes not only stress to the caregiver, to the patient, but even to the doctor as well. And of course, we know that it predisposes to allograft loss. And this will, of course, uh, bring up issues of reinitiation of dialysis, retransplantation. Most of these th things are very, very expensive. We do not know the burden of left graft dysfunction at 12 months within Kenya. And we hoped that this study would help us with that. So we aimed at describing kidney allograft function of kidney transplant recipients at one year and, as, and assessing the associated determinants at two transplant centers within Kenya. These were our objectives. 
Of course, the first one, the general one was to assess the function and determinants of um, kidney transplant recipients. The specific ones wanted to describe the selected pre-transplant donor and recipient characteristics because we know these, without describing them, you will not look for them as particular variables. To describe the frequency of kidney allograft recipients' primary diagnosis, we want to know most of our patients, what they have as their primary diagnosis. We wanted to describe individual kidney allograft recipients' serial creatinine. When you transplant someone, how do their creatinines move? Can we get a particular you know, trend? To describe a frequency of selected peri and post-transplant practices that are around um, our centers. We wanted to, to determine serial function using EGFR. And then secondarily, if we could, we hoped we could compare the clinical characteristics and biochemical factors in those who had allograft dysfunction and those who did not have allograft dysfunction. Because when you find them out, then you're able to say if the patient has, you know, you're able to look at factors that might be associated with allograft dysfunction. Then we hoped to describe the risk factors associated with kidney allograft dysfunction at 12 months post-transplant. When you describe risk factors, then you're able, you're able to stratify your patients and you're able to help them earlier and maybe intervene early for those who might look like they might get risk um, 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 graft dysfunction. So it was a re retrospective study. Good enough, we chose two sites because we wanted to get the numbers, but also wanted to see if there was any, any inter-hospital variability. These sites were chosen randomly. Uh, so there's a selection bias there. However, this was COVID times. This was last year. We could have done all, this, all the sites. That meant using many more people. It meant exposing many more people to COVID. And of course, the resources as a student, as you can imagine, were not very available. We looked at all patients, all the patients that trans transplanted at Kenyatta National Hospital and Aga Khan between 2009 and December 2018. We included all charts of patients that were transplanted and that, were, that had a documented serum creatinine, both at six months and at 12 months, because if they had those, then we were able to, were able to assess them. We had to, we had to exclude patients who were transplanted from other centers, but on follow-up from Kenyatta and Aga Khan, because these patients might not have the records, we might not know what they did, and that would have been, um, you'd have brought up some bias of remembering and stuff. Of course, if someone died before 12 months, we excluded them because then would not know what their graft function was at 12 months. Anything that caused graft loss by one year, we excluded those patients because we wanted to have a functioning graft, but with a, a dysfunction. So graft loss before one year, patients that underwent a graft nephrectomy, those that experienced primary graft failure, we excluded all of them. So those were our variables, as we talked about in the risk factors. We looked at, um, uh, we defined the dependent variable as uh, kidney allograft dysfunction of more than 1.5 milligrams per deciliter, uh, which was equal to 132.6 millimoles at 12 months. The donor variables like talked about earlier on, uh, age, gender, you know, pre-existing disease, smoking history, we looked at all of these within the files. The recipient variables like age, gender, primary disease, um, HLA mismatches, induction therapy, drugs, even the surgical time, the post-surgical complications, uh, we took time and looked at all of that. So this is how we defined, I think I'll just maybe look at maybe one or two or three. Um, one of the things I want to bring out is how we defined blood transfusion. So there is peritransplant and there is pre-transplant. Peritransplant blood transfusion is if you get transfusion within, within, within the transplant, um, within one to two weeks within transplant, and if you have used a leukocyte filter. 
if you haven't used the leukocyte filter, we classified you as pre-transplant blood transfusions and, you know, so that we can have a difference on that. Dialysis of intage was looked at, duration of time in months from initiation of dialysis to transplantation. Another thing, um, yes, the duration of surgery was defined in hours. And this was the time from initiation of anesthesia induction and extubating the patient. So let's look at the results. What did we find when we look at all this? I'll look at the results and discuss since I only have about maybe five or six minutes to go. We looked at 240 patients. These are the patients who are transplanted over a 10 year period at two centers. Unfortunately, due to missing vital information, people who died before one year, we were able to get 108 charts from Kenyatta. We were able to get 42 charts. From... <laughs> 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 all, we got one. We have some members uh, talking. Right. So, of the 150 charts, when we looked at the characteristics, remember, we wanted to look at the baseline characteristics of the donors, we wanted to look at the baseline characteristics of the recipients. So we looked at the, you know, the donor age. Interesting, we had we had very young donors, you know, fairly young, 33, with a with a range of about 28, 39. It is very common within Africa to have young donors because most of our programs, in any in any case, are live uh, uh, live donation programs. It is rare to find that someone who was above 60 is donating. Most of our donors, like we were not aware actually, but were actually males. So, you know, males are actually doing something good for this country and uh, we thank them. Uh, interestingly, most of the males who are donating were actually married. I don't know if they were forced by their spouses, but we did not look into that. And of course, most of the donors were first degree, um, were first degree um, do donors. And we had a very good pre-donation pre pre um, nephrectomy EGFR of 96, which is in keeping with the guidelines of the KDGO, who say above uh, below 80, you want to think, you want to think twice. The thing that is covered by this is the, is the donor kidney side. Most of our donor nephrectomies were left nephrectomies. So when it came to the recipients, we had about, we had young recipients fairly of about 36 years um, on average. Most of them were males, again, something about the male. And again, most of them were married. I, I do not know why marriage is, is coming up. Um, again, the recipients were mainly hypertensive or hypertensive and diabetics, which is, uh, which is, which is most in keeping with most of our data of chronic kidney disease within, um, within Kenya. One thing I want to, want to, think I want to bring, um, to bring your, your um, attention to is the presence of, uh, right there, the presence of urine protein, about, about 95, so about a percentage that, about something percentage of patients had uh, urine protein. So when they are young, and most of them have urine protein, and we shall, as we shall see later, they were hypertensives. So this gets you wondering, well, maybe another, another diagnosis to wonder about is chronic glomerulonephritis. Most of our patients had a dialysis vintage of about 14 months. And again, they were with most of our patients who are normal BMI, which is a good thing. But we did have some who are underweight, um, of a, a fairly, fairly um, good percentage. Um, we also had patients who received methylprednisolone pulse therapy, about the percent of the result you can see, yeah, about 32%. So some of the patients were receiving um, empiric therapy, methylprednisolone. We wanted to look at the EGFR and how it moves through the months after transplantation. As you can see, uh, most of the patients reached their good EGFR at three months. When I say good is when they are, it seems when they stabilize at about three months, 
So it means by about three months, if your patient hasn't gotten a good GFR, they might uh, not, not get it. I'm gonna rush through this. Um, again, we try to stage the eGFR according to stages in each of, the, each of the patients. And at each of the times, we have the discharge, one month, three months, six and 12, and 12 months. Most of our patients are within grade two. Most of our patients are within grade two. A few patients in grade 3A, even as it comes to the third, um, to the third six and 12 months, the good thing is we have most of our patients in grade one and grade two, which is a very, very, very good thing for us. So what happened when we reached, um, when we looked at the kidney transplant recipients with allograft dysfunction? First of all, the prevalence of allograft dysfunction was actually about 22, 22.6% at one year. So a quarter of our patients actually do have allograft dysfunction within, within one year. And on bivariate analysis, we found that the male gender, the people who are married, again, marriage comes up, I do not know why, people who receive pretransplant blood transfusion, people who received empiric methylprednisolone therapy, patients who had acute kidney injury in their first year, and if you had a high creatinine at three months, at discharge and six months, you are associated with kidney allograft dysfunction. What does this mean for us in, uh, in practice? It means, it could suggest, when you look at the male gender, when, you look, when we looked at um, a study done by Dr. Kubo a few years ago in transplant patients, most of the patients who had uncontrolled hypertension were actually males. So could this suggest that these patients have uncontrolled hypertension and it is causing the allograft dysfunction? We do not know because we do not look at that in this particular study. Pre-transplant blood transfusion could, associate, could, uh, could like Dr. Barasa was saying, could cause allosensitization and could cause maybe rejection. No wonder some of these patients did receive empiric methylprednisolone therapy. And of course, again, rejection can be caused, can, be, can lead to acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury can be caused by many things during, trans, during the first year of transplant. No wonder it was associated with allograft dysfunction. For the, yeah, this is one we talked about it already. Now, one thing I want to bring your attention to is we did compare the hospitals when it came to the, the outcome, AKA um, graft dysfunction. And we did not have any difference of graft dysfunction within the hospitals. So a subgroup analysis was not necessary for this particular study. So this is, this is the gist of the matter. The risk factors. Our study was powered. Our study was powered enough to look at the secondary objectives. We had an 85% power uh, at about 150 um, charts. So we went ahead and did a risk factor analysis for our patient for the particular charts. And indeed, we looked, we found out that. If a patient had acute kidney injury within the first year, we defined acute kidney injury as a rise in serum creatinine 1.5 times from the previous clinic visit. So if you came with 110 today, the next day you came with 140, we would call that acute kidney injury. So any documented acute kidney injury in the first year had 13 fold increase in risk of getting allograft dysfunction with a p-value of 0 0.008. Another one was, that was interesting, we did not expect this, was a duration of surgery. Patients who stayed in theater for more than 3.5 hours. So we, we remember we said we are defining um, surgery time as from induction to extubation. If that took more than 3.5 hours, those patients were at a five time increased risk of allograft dysfunction at one year. This brings out issues to think about during the surgery. 
So I'd like to bring your attention to the other factors that were not statistically significant, but had very interesting um, adjusted, adjusted odds ratios. The male gender, I do not know something about the males. We shall look into it. But the males, hmm? they are called that. In, in Uganda, we say Avasaja. But the males were at four times, fourfold, had a fourfold risk, you know, increased risk of getting allograft dysfunction in our, in our particular study. And so was the patient who received blood transfusion, a three times increased risk of getting allograft dysfunction. A patient who received methylprednisolone therapy, which we normally use to treat T cell mediated rejection empirically, you know, had a two-fold risk of getting allograft dysfunction. So this is something for us to think about as, um, as we are doing our, uh, our, our care. So what did, what did this study offer? So we were able to describe the prevalence of allograft dysfunction. We know about its burden now, about a quarter of the patients do have allograft dysfunction at one year. Um, we now know the clinical parameters that are associated with kidney allograft dysfunction within our community. And these, fact, these factors can be looked at, can be risk stratified in our patients so that we know this person is at a risk of allograft dysfunction at one year and we should do something about it. My time is done. Uh, we had a few limitations, of course, being a retrospective study and, and, uh, and its shortfalls. However, we trace, try to use many centers so that we can have the numbers. And we also use some, some good statistical methods to try and use, um, try, and, try and reduce the risks of uh, using uh, miss, miss, miss data. So in conclusion, the study has shown that allograft dysfunction is present in about a quarter of our patients at one year. And one of some of the risk factors to think about is um, acute kidney injury and also undergoing surgery for more than 3.5 um, hours. These are my recommendations. And uh, we thank those who are on that list. And we miss Dr. Weary very, very much. Thank you very much.